Good morning, everybody. Today is Terrific Tuesday. It's a little bit different because yesterday I did um, a 9-11 tribute and I used my dear friends, Paul and Gina Nelson. Paul was a retired NYPD detective and I've seen him lately and he is really, really struggling with the after effects of 9-11 and all the things that happened on 9-11. So I felt it was appropriate that I honor him and his beautiful, beautiful wife, Gina, because after all, those who were left behind on 9-11 are the ones that are truly paying the price. The rest of them have gone to be with Jesus. So today is Terrific Tuesday as we remember and we honor and we think about those who um, lost their lives that day. Many of them were just doing their job. Some of them were innocent electricians who were there working on the property. There were just so many, so many people who just by chance, by happen, by God's design were in that building. So, so I did want to pay tribute to 9-11 yesterday. And because I've had a really, really hard time breathing last week, today I'm breathing, y'all. Today I'm breathing. It feels so good feels so good because I was convinced that I had the bad stuff, but I didn't. I was convinced I had strep, but I didn't. But I did feel like I had razor blades in my throat and uh, I could not swallow and it hurt like the dickens and I was irritated. And I want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Ella J. Dwight Sanford for sitting in and doing the things that I needed done because I couldn't do it. I couldn't hardly stand to be around myself, so it was tough. But he handled it like a prince that he is. He's a good one. So, you know, you say he's a good one and you really mean it. And you say, oh, he's a good one. And you, nah, you know, he's a good one. So, so thank you. Today we're going to be sharing a very special birthday. Today is Evelyn's birthday. Evelyn was born on the 13th. I was born on the 13th. Evelyn's husband, Scotty, was born on the 13th. I took Evelyn yesterday and we invaded a beautiful, beautiful place on Old Highway 5 here in it's Gilmer County, but it's a talking rock address. They grow the most beautiful zinnias and sunflowers and they have a corn maze and they weren't open, but we invited them anyway. And so, and we shared the pictures with the owner and they love it. And we want to share these pictures with y'all. You have got to go out there this weekend. They're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And truly, I went down there to take some more pictures of the old Rebel Inn on a project we're working on, but I'm, I had these beautiful, beautiful people who showed up and I, they're my Facebook friends and I said, let's get some pictures and so we did, is that not gorgeous? Three generations, one generation was missing and they said, oh my goodness, if we had mom here, it would be all four of us, but, but is that not the coolest thing ever? So make plans this weekend. It is supposed to be absolutely beautiful this weekend. I can't think of anything more fun than going down there. But when you get there, you tell Timothy that he should be playing Mr. Ella J's music in the background. If you come to Ella J and you don't know anything about it, you want to hear the music, welcome to Ella J. So there you go. We also, I want to share some pictures of pears that I was gifted with yesterday. Now, I've been stopping and asking people for pears off their trees and I've been getting them. Y'all, you can, it doesn't show the size of these pears. They are huge. And these were a gift from one of Dwight's cousins over in Chatsworth. And I'm telling you, they're the biggest pears I have ever seen. And we are gifting some of them to somebody else very special. So these pears are fantastic. Get out and pick them up off the ground and, and make pear relish, make pear honey make pear preserves, but do it, do it, do it, do it. Now, Miss Evelyn's birthday being today, I got up early this morning and I cooked her salmon patties and I also made her a bread pudding and guess what I used in it? Pear honey. Well, of course I would because I've got tons of it. So I made her her little birthday gift instead of going out and buying her something she doesn't need because she doesn't like clutter and she doesn't like stuff. I gave her something she could dispose of quickly. So when she eats it, the evidence is gone. And uh, happy, happy birthday to Evelyn. They are approaching the 20th anniversary of her father's death. And uh, sadly, her father was murdered and um, he was a good, good guy helping someone else and he was killed. So they are having a hard time with this. Her, she and her brothers and her sister, they're all struggling because their dad is not with them anymore. 
If you have your mom, if you have your dad, if you have your aunt, your uncle, those special people in your life, hug them today because as we come out of that 9-11 event, we all know that there's so many families, the dynamics of the family changed on 9-11. The dynamics of our families could change. Yesterday, as Evelyn and I were going up to Morganton, we saw a horrific accident. And um, I just had a really, really bad feeling about this one. And I said, somebody's life changed today and somebody's family changed today. So gather up those that you love and tell them you love them and, and give them a little bit of support and, um, and know that we are not promised tomorrow. We are not promised tomorrow. Today's program is going to be about a lot of special people <coughs> who have overcome addiction. And um, you know our family history. Um, not many people know that my father was also an addict. My daughter was an addict. I have a son who's an addict. I have so many people who have been in my life that um, let drugs take over their life. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But we're going to share some really cool shots. We worked on a new commercial on Friday. And I'm going to tell you, God is so good because... It'd been rainy, it'd been foggy, it'd been cruddy looking, and then all of a sudden it was just perfection. And so we have some great shots of that. And that is the view. If you're trying to sell the mountains, you want people to understand the peace, the quiet, the sanity. And I, I said the tagline for the new commercial says, Welcome to North Georgia. The leaves are falling and the mountains are calling. And boy, is that not the truth. And uh, it is just so beautiful out today. I think the temperature was 58 degrees this morning. That's like heaven. And that is the coolest thing ever invented, y'all. That is a grill that is amazing to cook on if you are smart enough to figure out how to do it. And I think I've mastered it. it took me a little bit, but I think I've mastered it. But it is made out of old school bus wheels or old big truck wheels. I'm not sure if it's truck or school bus, but is that not the coolest thing ever? And then that is the shot that um, will, uh, it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You can see Fort Mountain, you can see Grassy Creek. It is just absolutely gorgeous. And when you look at that, we're off of Highway 52, but we are looking um, in the direction of Eton, which is way up north on 411. So it's really, really cool to see that. We will want you to get out and enjoy these beautiful, beautiful mountains. Go down on Old Highway 5. Go down to pick yourself some zinnias. I think it's $10 to pick a whole cup full of them. And I'm going to give you the advice of the world. Save the seeds and plant some yourself because theirs are a beautiful, beautiful variety and they're huge, huge and healthy. So, so do that this weekend. It's going to be beautiful. And again, it's going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, I want to share something with y'all. Um, because of what the theme is today, it's, it's a little bit of a deep theme, but it's also a, a theme of hope. Because I don't care what stage your family's at with addiction, if you have somebody who is just down to the last, down to the end, giving up, um, can't get through it. I want you to listen to a song that's written by Dorothy Hightower. She is the lead singer for Broken Ground, or she's the lead mama for Broken Ground. Her, her daughter, Sarah, is really the lead singer. But this is called The Word in Me. And I want you to listen to every single word. I remember the first time I heard it, I was sitting right over here on the set, and it started playing. It's supposed to be, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Y'all can fire me. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. It is, it is Angel Spirit, Family Circle First. And we're doing this in honor of every single family who is no longer connected, who is no longer together. Maybe you lost somebody. <clears throat> maybe, maybe somebody did die of an overdose. Maybe, you know, you gave up and uh, maybe you gave in to the addiction. And, and so the family circle does get broken, but there are so many families out there that the family circle is complete again because somebody came out of addiction. I'm not gonna name any names, but we have a dear friend who has been clean and sober over 10 years now. And every time she posts something, I just say, hallelujah, hallelujah. She's amazing, she is absolutely amazing. She lives up in the Ducktown community and I'm so very, very proud of her. So. So we're going to go to Angel Spirit and Family Circle, and then when we come back, we're going to do The Word in Me in just a little bit, because that is the one that Dorothy Hightower wrote. She wrote it over 20 years before she recorded it. And when you listen, somebody in your life is going to influence you. You may be in a grocery store and you may overhear something. You may be out in the woods in a tree stand and you may hear a brush of, of God's being there, and you may 
feel his presence. There's something in your life that will change where you're headed today. You may be headed down the wrong track. You may be headed on the right track. You may be headed to a better track. But something is going to influence your life. And when you listen to the song, The Word in Me, you will understand that. So we're going to share a little bit of music with you. And then you're going to get to meet a gentleman who actually works in the uh, recovery industry. When you think about how many people do make it out and how many people do successfully do this and then how many people fail. I don't know what the failure rate is, but I know that every single family watching us today probably knows somebody who has been affected by addiction of some kind, whether it be alcohol, pills, um, heroin, it doesn't matter. Um, the drug market is wide open, and you know why it's wide open? It's a whole lot of money being made on it, and that's what it's all about, sadly. And then once you're hooked, it is often the end of a life, and we're going to share that story when we come back shortly.
whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ. How may I serve you? United Country Talking Rock Realty says it best. I'm happy as long as I can see Sharp Top. From the ground up, new home to complete renovation or remodel, we have combined the amazing workmanship of SGC groups, transforming the forgotten to the fabulous. Teamwork makes the dream work. For buying, selling, or flipping, call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at 770-733-0779. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. Come on, darling, take me downtown because I want to see some of that Blue Ridge Georgia. Here we go. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. High-speed Wi-Fi, not quite as important as running water in your home, but close. Ignite Internet from ETC powers your Wi-Fi network with consistent speeds to keep all your gadgets going strong. Streaming video players, laptops, tablets, even smartphones, so you're never stuck with those big cell data charges. And talk about value. Just pick your speed and keep the Wi-Fi flowing in your home at a great low price. Upgrade your Internet today. Call or visit etcnow.com to learn more. We're back. Uh, that music was featuring Selena. Selena Hale singing lead. We love, love, love that lady and uh, praying for her and praying for a complete recovery from this awful cancer that she is fighting and she is fighting and she is not going to give in. Um, what, what a beautiful voice and what a beautiful spirit and angel spirit has been around for many, many years. The day that I first brought them to live television, Fred Wyndham had on his headset and he heard them sing and he said, oh my gosh, they are amazing. Yes, amazing. Sadly, Diane has gone to be with the Lord or happily for Diane and um, they're no longer singing together, but what a joy to be able to share that music with y'all. So we did that. Now we're gonna share a song um, that Dorothy Hightower wrote. And honestly, I don't know why she had it for 20 years before she recorded it. And I don't know why it was meant for me to be sitting on this set on live TV the first time I ever heard it because I got cold chills that ran up and down my spine. And I said, oh my gosh, it was so touching. So I want y'all to sit back and I want you to listen to every single word of this. And then today, as you spend your day out and about in the community, I want you to know that you could make a difference in somebody's life. And when we come back, you're gonna get to meet the young man who's joining me and we're gonna be talking about making a difference in life because we all have the ability to do that. You don't have to be a counselor, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to hold a doctorate, but you have to be a kind human being. And that is what life is truly about. Dorothy Hightower, if you open the dictionary to Webster's and it says kind human, it should say Dorothy Hightower. 
So I want you to listen now to every single word of the word in me. A young man was praying when God spoke to him. He said, you'll preach tomorrow a word that I'll give. But at daybreak the snow fell, he was bound to his home. He said, Lord, I don't understand. I feel this message so strong. And he said the word in me, it cries in my heart like fire in my bones. It's been from the start. Lord, you've given me life and more abundantly, and I thank you, O oh Lord, for the word in me. So out in the backwoods, he walked for a while. That would give your heart a chill Overwhelmed by the Spirit And God's perfect will And He said the word in me It cries in my heart Like fire in my bones It's been from the start Lord, you give And I thank you, O oh Lord, for the word in me. Twenty years later, his faith holding strong, he heard a young preacher singing a song. And when he told this young man, You've blessed my heart so. He said, You blessed me too, sir, 20 years ago. For I was in those backwoods with nowhere to go. Well, that's when I heard those sweet words and it freed my soul. Oh, you thought. But now Jesus lives within me, and now I have the Word. Oh, the Word in me, it cries in my heart like fire in my bones. It's been from the start, Lord, you've given Yes, I thank you, O oh Lord, for the word in me. We're back, y'all. Still gives me cold chills, still makes my heart tingle. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, we've already taken our commercial break, but I want to share something with y'all. I was invited to visit a little church up in McKaysville, Georgia, and I spent Sunday with some of the most precious, amazing, amazing people. And to each and every one of you, thank you so very much. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for hugging me. Thank you for making me feel so welcome to Alice Griggs. I love you. She is so precious. And uh, just what a wonderful, wonderful day. So we want to share a little bit. This was the 108th anniversary of the Methodist Church in McKaysville, Georgia. It's about this big, and it was packed. Over 100 people were there. I was doing a head count. 
and it was absolutely amazing. But at the end of the day, Alice and her sons stood up and they did a song, and I just have to share it with y'all. Alice is one of those young widows who lost John way too early. He was a wonderful force in the, in his family. He was just such a wonderful, wonderful man. So, so today his family is carrying on the tradition of singing and. Here we go to Alice and to Josh, and just thank you, thank you, thank you to McKaysville, to the Methodist Church. What a wonderful day. Thank you so much. And to the lady who made the coconut cake, you are the best. You are the best. <laughs> we'll be back in just a minute. I'll be We're back. I wish y'all could have been to that little church. No, no, wait a minute. If we'd have invited anybody else, they wouldn't have fit because it was packed. It was packed. It was packed. It was packed. But to everybody, to Becky and to Lee and to Alice and to Larry, to everybody who said, Sherry, please come and visit, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. And it's so funny as a child, and Charlie, I don't know about your religion and your church and your background, but as a child, we often lived where we had to walk to church and so I would walk to the Methodist Church, I'd walk to the Church of God, I'd walk to the uh, Holiness Church, didn't matter. If we lived in a community, we had to walk to church because mother was going through this atheist time in her life. Mm -hmm. But I still wanted to go to church. So um, you are here today because you have been a part of a recovery. Blue Ridge Mountain Recovery Center is located in downtown Ball Ground. Yes, ma'am. And uh, a big part of helping those who have often given up, often families give up and say, I'm done, I'm not helping anymore, and then they find somebody who can help. Can you tell a little bit about your story? First of all, introduce yourself and tell folks your name. Hey, everybody. I'm Charlie Spradley. Um, and he's a baby, y'all. He's 29. <laughs> he's younger than my grandkids. Come on. That's making me feel so old, Charlie. I wish you'd have said I'm 46. <laughs> no, that's what I tell our clients, actually. Yeah. Uh, I try not to leave with my age because, you know, they may not listen to me up yeah, yeah, they yeah. Know I'm, You're a baby. <laughs> You're a baby. Oh. And I love real men wear pink. <laughs> I love that. He, he just, he hit a home run when he walked in the door, so... <laughs> Okay, go ahead. All right, so I'm actually the alumni director. I'll, I'll start at the begin, or start at the current, and then work my way back, and then come back up to the present. But okay. I'm the I'm the alumni director at Blue Ridge Mount Recovery. I've been there for almost six years now. Started out as a tech, and then moved on at, into a counselor role, and I'm, I'm a bit of jack of all trades mm -hmm. <laughs> around there. So I do a little bit of everything, but. 
you know, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to come on here today and, you know, talk a little bit about my experience with, you know, get, getting sober mm -hmm. and, you know, being a little bit vulnerable about that and being open. Um, hopefully that someone can relate and, and know that recovery is possible. What age were you when you started doing drugs? About 13, mm -hmm. about 13. Mm -hmm. My daughter so. was 13, yeah. Yep. So. That's a very tough age, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I got sober two weeks before I turned 21. So wow. Never had a legal drink, so. Wow, <laughs> isn't that something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Were your parents along for the ride or did they give up on you? Oh, uh, I think they were along for the ride. You know, by the, en by the end, I think they, they just didn't know how to help and uh, they finally showed up, showed up for me right at the end and, you know, really drew a hard line. Um, you know, home, when you're that deep in the throes of addiction, homelessness doesn't really sound that bad, which is, I know that crazy. sounds crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to look at my kids and say, you're giving up all this for that? Yeah. And have you heard the poem, My Name is Crystal Meth? Mm -mm. Okay, Wait, my yeah, yes, maybe, yes, yeah. my daughter read it on the air years and years ago, and we had so many people contact us and said, that's exactly right, one hit of crystal meth and you're hooked forever. Mm. She owns your soul, she controls every move in your body, and you can't wait to have her again. And that was the problem, because people don't understand if you're 13 and you're at a party and your friends say, this makes you feel so good. What do you do? Well, if, if I were to go back, you know, I think I still would have done it. Mm -hmm. you know, just Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. So who were the bad influences in your life? Where people, this, is, this is where I fell fail short. My daughter would always be with people and I'd say, well, she seems like such a nice girl. And later mother would say, mother, she was my dealer. Are you crazy? <laughs> you are a terrible judge of character. You can tell that by looking around me sometimes, you know. Oh, yeah. But it was so weird because I would always, you can't tell, can you? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a bit of a, a magnet, I guess, for drawing in some of those people mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know. I, My mama called me, she'd say, you're a scum bucket magnet. You drag <laughs> in people that I wouldn't let tote our trash. And I would get a speech. Did your parents judge your friends? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's our job as parents. So, that's our job so. as parents yeah. to judge your friends. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Now, are you married? No, not no. married. Okay. No kids. Yeah. Tried the engagement thing before, but didn't work. You know. Yeah. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. <laughs> okay. So fast forward. You're 13. You're doing drugs. Yeah. Where does it go and where does it spiral out of control? Well, I, th I think it all stemmed, you know, a, a big part of it for me was, um, you know, my, I, in, with my parents, there was some, you know, experience with addiction um, with them. And, and when I was 11, my, my dad was, you know, intoxicated and driving and, you know, on the way to get drugs. And he went off the road w with it wow. raining and, you know, um, was ejected from the vehicle and, you Did know, he, die? So he died. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Was that a wake up call for you? At that time, no, no, no not no. at all. No, wow. I, I thought I should be able to, you know, avoid it because I, I saw it affect my family in such uh -huh. a devastating uh -huh. way, but yeah, yeah. it didn't happen to me. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was laughing the other day. I, well, actually, yesterday I was talking to Evelyn, and we were talking about food addictions and, and different addictions. And I said, um, when my daughter Angela was born, she should have been addicted to three things, a varsity chili dog, a Burger King Whopper, and vodka. <laughs> because I don't drink anymore, and I haven't had a drink in 48 years. But I drank vodka until I was seven months pregnant. Now think about what I did to that baby. Mm. And I didn't know any different. I was 18 years old. I was married and pregnant and oh, you know. My husband drank, you know. And and you don't think about that. The, they so, didn't know then, probably. Yeah. So that you thing. did you come here with an addiction in your body? Is that one of the things that we find of addicts that your parents were addicted? So did you have that chemical imbalance? Yeah, I, th I, th I definitely think there's a component there as far as, you know, the 
it being genetic in nature, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't always exist. I mm -hmm. mean, if it, anybody's ever heard of somebody being the black sheep of their family, mm -hmm. you know, that does, that's, that's the exception that um, maybe only one person, you know, it could be the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. And and the environment you choose out. to be in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you want everybody to like you. You want everybody to <laughs> like you. You want everybody to like you. I, I'm the designated driver. I still have friends who drink a little bit of wine, like two glasses of wine, and so I have a bunch of old ladies I would drive. Mm -hmm. I still don't trust myself ever drinking. I had two drinks one night and ran a stop sign, and so years and years ago I gave it up. I had a six-month-old child, and I said, God, I'll never do this again, and I never did that again. Wow. It was easy for me, so I, don't, I didn't understand my children. Why can't you just quit that? Yeah. Why can't you just quit that? Why right. can't you just quit that? Yeah. What's it, the big deal? Why it, don't you just quit? I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I completely, yeah. We actually do our family workshop with our clients' families, and you know, we, ha we have to ex fully explain the disease of addiction and how, mm -hmm. and how powerful this thing is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, e even just talking about the neurotransmitters in your brain, mm -hmm. you know, the release of dopamine compared between methamphetamine and any other experience that you could have on this earth is so drastically different that it's, I mean, it's, on the verge of neurotoxic in your brain. So, it, I mean, it's like, you know, to infinity with mm -hmm. the level of good feeling they feel. Mm -hmm. And then it's so depleted that it goes lower than natural levels mm -hmm. anyway. So, mm -hmm. so then they need to get back, they can't <coughs> even find that baseline again. So for a long time, mm -hmm. it takes time. Mm -hmm. That's what I've always heard that you never achieve that first high again that you never get there and you try and you try and you try and, and many die. Now, Charlie, how many, how many friends do you know who died of drug overdoses? Uh, roughly 20, 25, yeah. probably, yeah. directly. Yeah. Yeah. In one summer, my daughter, 11 friends died of drugs. And, and that's why my, my faith in God is so real because my daughter did the same exact drugs that every one of those people did. These same exact drugs, the same batch of drugs, same drugs, as much drugs, as many right. drugs. And she is still here today by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And that is the only reason she is still here because no other, her body, her, her chemistry, her, there was no reason. But she, she didn't die. Well, that, that speaks to, to me because, you know, I, I, I choose to look at it like, you know, God had a different purpose for me. There was many opportunities for me to, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. not make it through, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. with, with experiences close to overdose right. and different things. So. Yeah. You know, when Dawn was in a program, she did the 12-step program. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you work with? Well, I, I mean, there's a level of anonymity as far as, you okay. know, personal experience okay. or anything like that. Um, I will say that they ha the clients at our facility have exposure to 12-step programs. Mm -hmm. Um, throughout their stay, you know, we, we're not necessarily only a 12-step program or anything like that. We, we include multiple modalities of treatment mm -hmm. as far as, you know, psychotherapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and a bunch, a bunch of different ways. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't choose to subscribe to the idea that, you know, AA or 12 steps mm -hmm. has necessarily a monopoly on recovery. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that she had said was the hardest was to ask forgiveness to those, those that she had hurt. Yeah. And, and that is, um, she and I are super close now, and it's like if, if we go a day and don't talk, it's kind of weird because we always talked. But when she was doing drugs, I always knew when she was doing drugs because she avoided me. Did you avoid your loved ones when you were doing drugs? Oh yeah, completely. Um, I, unless they could, you know, help you get drugs. Help me get drugs and mm -hmm. manip You know, I can manipulate them to give me, mm -hmm. give me money and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And when they started holding those boundaries, um, I thought it was from a position of hate, not love. Mm -hmm. And I, back to the forgiveness part, really is, you know, I, I think that part was easier um, to forgive, uh, to forgive others, came so much easier. Mm. than forgiving myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I told somebody last night, when my daughter committed suicide, I stood at her casket, and you know who took the heat and who took the blame for her death? Mm. I did, because it was my fault. Mm. 
if I'd have been a better mother, she wouldn't have done this. If I hadn't done this, she wouldn't have done this. It was my fault. It wasn't my fault. It was a choice that she made. But it's one of those things. Did your parents ever say, had we lived a different life, maybe you wouldn't have gone down that road? Did they ever take the blame? Oh, yeah. Oh, they, they have. And honestly, I think forgiveness works in a way that it's not just something we say. I think it's something that I have to ask God to remove from me. Mm -hmm. So it may not go away immediately, mm -hmm. but I, I, I believe that anything that I experience, you know, I'm going to probably drink or get high again, but if I don't try to forgive you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. anyone and everyone mm -hmm, at, mm -hmm. at some point, no matter what happened to mm -hmm. me or what the circumstances were. Well, when you sat down, I told you, hand me my cup because this is my cup. I will not be shaken. Yeah. That is not me at all, but that is what I try to live by because that is not me because I can, I can be shaken. I'm the king of mantras. Yeah, yeah all I, that, I can you know. be shaken, but... Psalm 16, 9 says, I will not be shaken. That is the hardest thing in the world to be as close to sobriety, recovery, so, so close, 27 days into the program, and you screw up. Did you screw up when you were in a program? I did not, I did not have the experience. Once I got to the program, I tried to quit by myself so many times. Oh, wow. And by the time I got, got the treatment, I wasn't ready for it, but I, I went to a program on top of a mountain, and they said you could... You could leave, but you're just probably not going to make it to the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> good deal, good <laughs> so, deal. <laughs> so I, I just fought with that idea. Uh, well, I could leave, I could leave, I want to leave. Trying to get my family to bow down, but they wouldn't do it. And slowly over time, you know, I started to realize doing the opposite of what I want to do seems to be working out for me. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. my life continually got better and better. And I think recovery is not so much about all the things I can get. Mm -hmm. Like, or my life getting better and I get the things, the material possessions or whatever. I think it's more about like when life shows up and gets really, really hard because mm -hmm. everyone goes through really difficult things. Mm -hmm. It's in those moments, like, how do I respond? Mm -hmm. Like, I go, I go through a difficult challenge and my first response is not to get high or to get drunk. That's nothing short of a miracle for me. It's mm -hmm. like God has completely taken that away from me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel neutral. Wow. Wow. Now, when you are in a program yourself, mm -hmm. do you do you medicate at all? Are there things, because I know a lot of people take drugs to keep you from craving drugs. Yeah. Isn't there something out there? Yeah, we, I mean, we use medications as far as like, you know, Blue Ridge that are for medical detox, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because they say it's dangerous. You can go into right. DTs and people can literally die. Primarily with, you know, alcohol and benzodiazepines, you know, like Xanax and, uh -huh. you know, Clonopin and various drugs like that. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually the, like, people say, well, heroin and, meth, you know, meth are the worst. It's like, well, with these, like, you're coming off, like, you're probably, you have a chance of dying from alcohol. Your heart Xanax, could go, yeah. your heart could end Everything, up. Everything, yeah. yeah. There's a lot, a lot of different things that could happen. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I, we do some medically assisted treatment, but not long term. That's mm -hmm. not, that's mm -hmm. not our goal. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. don't, you know, we don't do methadone or anything mm, like that's that. That's what I was, that's the one I was right. thinking about. Because I know people who've been on methadone for 20 years. Yeah. 20 years. And I don't understand that because I'm like, okay, if you haven't done drugs in 20 years, then why are you still doing this? But I don't, I don't get the, y'all, I failed biology. I You're failed good. science. I had a 23 average. I do not get the chemical problems with any of this. But I do know that there is a force to be reckoned with. And I told you before we went on the air, I did everything to save my daughter. I did everything, everything that money could buy. Right. I paid for a treatment facility, I did everything I could, I went to the treatment facility every day, I did my homework, I did my research, I did everything. But then one day I turned her over to God. Mm -hmm. And she's been clean and sober ever since. So what was I thinking? Do parents need to just let them hit the bottom, get rock bottom and let them decide to come up or die? What do you do? No, I, I think the best thing that you can do is do the work on yourself, you know, get, get, get support through, you know, one of the things that we recommend the most is like Al-Anon mm -hmm. for the family members mm -hmm. of people or Nar-Anon mm -hmm. um, for the family members affected by addiction because... It is a family problem. Right. Yeah. 
completely. And it, you know, cause there's also other problems that exist in the family that you know exacerbate some of those mm -hmm. some of those symptoms that that person's acting out on. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, that would be my encouragement for them to do their work or seek therapy themselves, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe that looks like individual counseling. Mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. there's, there should be treatment just for the family. When know, people check into your facility, do most of them have a, I don't want to be here attitude or most of them, I'm so desperate for help, I'm glad I'm here. What, is it 50-50? What is it like? I don't know. I don't know about a statistic or like what, it, what that looks like. Um, I I think it it was prob it's prob so I don't know if it's more important for somebody to be ready. Mm -hmm. I don't I really honestly don't think so because I don't think it's predictive of our outcomes. Mm -hmm. Like I like I said, like I didn't want to be in treatment, mm -hmm. but I was shown love and support and empathy and acceptance and these things that you know I. I was never able to give myself, so experiencing those things over a period of time um, brought me to a level of, or made me move from a complete hopelessness, was virtually suicidal, mm -hmm. and to a place where I actually want to live life, and mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest thing, realizing that, like, you know, my emotions are temporary, and I'm not going to always feel this way. Mm -hmm. and. So I see people come in completely sick and broken and angry and all these things, but at the end of the 35 days that they're there with us, they, they can possibly be a complete different person. My encounter with that person as if it's not the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it com that's, that's my experience, and that's why I continue to do it, because mm -hmm. it's, it's beyond rewarding mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. to see that kind of change. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was so weird when when um, the lady I talked about and I didn't give her name has been cleaning this over 10 years, and I'm just so proud of her, you know, and I, I know where she was, and, and you just heard music from somebody who had been an addict, and, and the music was just beautiful, and, <clears throat> and, you know, we see from those fire and ashes, we see glory often, and it's just amazing. It is amazing. Now, what about if, if somebody enters your facility and um, is it the way the program Dawn was in, it was under lock and key. They can't come and go, right? Mm. They are locked up. Not where I'm up. Not where no, we not were. where you are. Okay. <laughs> well, where she was, it was under lock and key. Yeah. And she didn't like that. And she rebelled. Mm -hmm. And it was tough. And we, you know, we basically physically put her in a car, locked the doors, and said, we're going to take you. We, sh we headed down toward Atlanta, and she thought we were going to the Atlanta airport and send her to Utah, <laughs> to the mountains. You said you were on top of a mountain. Oh, yeah. And she had seen something we'd been looking at in Utah, but we sent her to a place in Atlanta. But it was lock and key, and there was no freedom there. There was no, but at the same time, she was thrown in there with a bunch of addicts and I got angry at myself because when she kind of got out, she said, Mom, I learned nine new drugs I didn't know anything about. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I spent $35,000 for you to learn more about drugs? Are you nuts? But that's what happened. She didn't come out of there wanting recovery. Right. She stayed on drugs another 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. So that one didn't work. What is your success rate at Blue Ridge Mountain? As far as success rate, it varies up and down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have a specific number, but I will say that, you know, everyone I've talked to and just what I experience at Blue Ridge on a daily basis is the, the culture is such that those things don't, like some people talking about, you know, their war stories is what we mm -hmm. call them sometimes, mm -hmm. or, you know, they're, they're you know, they, everybody tries to one-up each other and their, their type of stories. Mm -hmm. And so I think the culture at Blue Ridge is conducive to people fo being more focused compared to, you know, potentially other treatment or, or anything like that because I think, I, I th I think this, there's so much support from the staff and the people around that, you know, when we see those kind of things, we, we, set, we set boundaries. When we're going to see those things pop up, mm -hmm. we're probably going to pull each of those per people aside and, you know, have a conversation about, like, mm -hmm. you know, how that, how that is not good for them mm -hmm. and also how it may potentially harm someone else mm -hmm. if they go back right. to it, right? Right, right, that's right. 
Now, <clears throat> do you have group sessions or is it one-on-one -on -one group? Okay, oh, yeah. are people usually honest in session? Because that was one thing in the program she was in. She said, what a crock of crap. <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? She said, they want us to, on Friday nights, they had to get up and speak before everybody. And she said it was just so, you know, yeah, yeah weird. Yeah, I think some people are meant to do that like you, right? I mean, yeah, you, I'm meant to do it. <laughs> you're speaking yeah. to yeah. thousands of people. But, you know, other people need that small environment. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool thing. One-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, they have. So every client has an individual counselor. Mm -hmm. And then it, like, branches out from there. They have a small <laughs> group with their counselor and several the, the counselor's other clients. Mm -hmm. And so they are able to have a safe space <coughs> where they're only sharing with like, you know, six to 10 at most mm -hmm. people um, where they can develop a level of, you know, I'm not gonna say complete s safety or like a place where they could feel vul vulnerable mm -hmm. and open with, mm -hmm. with a group. But also there's the large groups and like one of the biggest things that Blue Ridge does is you know, we do a lot of didactic didactic lectures as far as like, you know, like if you were to go to a college and listen to somebody speak for an hour mm -hmm. and you, you may get a little bit out of out of that hour. But what we didn't <coughs> we try to do is we do this thing called experiential therapy. So we'll we'll do some kind of activity or game or role play or you know, various different things th that facilitates them actually processing their emotions on a deeper level than, mm -hmm. than we'd have access to if we just talk at them, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing that um, I, we're doing as far as the facility where, you know, every staff member is pretty much exper experiential trained where they can facilitate those kind of groups. Mm -hmm. And it's also, honestly my favorite thing to do is, you know, get in there and re really hit home to the, the deep pains and hurts mm -hmm. that these people have. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me, and, and I've, this has always been in my brain and I've processed it a million different ways. Mm -hmm. They said, I didn't wake up and want to be an addict. I woke up and wanted to get rid of the pain I was feeling over things that had happened to me. And, and when they said that, I understood addiction more than I ever had because like depression, I, I, I've dealt with depression a lot in the last 15 months. And um, I saw that and I was angry with myself because I felt it as a weakness. And I felt in the addiction thing, well, just suck it up, buttercup. What are you doing that for? And then when you really listen to them, they didn't wake up and want to be an addict today. They woke up and wanted to get rid of the hurt from a childhood scar or something horrible that had happened to them or something horrible they had witnessed, you know. And so they do the drugs to relieve that pain that they're dealing with. Do you see that in a lot of addicts? Yeah, that's, that, I mean, that's pretty common. I will also say that, you know, it's, you may, like you said, you may not know, like, that somebody's experiencing addiction or, you mm -hmm. know, has a problem mm -hmm. um, because they may be showing up in every area of their mm -hmm. life except for that's in regards to use of that substance. Mm -hmm. They may be, you know, have the perfect job. They may oh, have yeah. all the things, yeah. everything's good, and no one would know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that that doesn't point to a lack of willpower. They've exerted willpower in, mm -hmm. in various different areas of their life, but in that one thing, mm -hmm. if it reaches a point, it will prioritize itself over everything else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's that's my experience. Everything just started falling off sports, mm -hmm. um, you know, any relationships or connection to anyone, um, I would completely isolate by the end. I mm -hmm. just didn't want to mm -hmm. be around anybody to potentially mm -hmm. you know, harm myself. I, I was talking to a friend about six, four weeks ago <clears throat> and her brother went through something similar to that. and. Very successful, huge salary, great family, everything was wonderful. Painkillers, painkillers, painkillers. And um, she told me, she said, he is still fighting to get his life back, but he's fighting now. But he was very successful in every avenue. It's just like you said. Everything about his life was successful, but he became addicted to painkillers. Why? 
why do people, I, I, a painkiller makes, you know, I, I had massive surgery and I got to tell y'all, y'all keep laughing all you want to. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, have you had weight loss surgery? No, I did not have <laughs> weight loss surgery. I had reconstructive surgery to make my body work because my body had fallen apart. I laughed myself to death. Somebody said, she's lost a lot of weight. She must have had weight loss surgery. No, I did not. I came off steroids and I'm done. But it was so funny because people assume if you're thinning and if your bones stick out, you're a drug addict. Yeah. You're a drug addict. They just assume that. Well, no, maybe you're getting healthy. Maybe something, you know. But, but there's something about this addiction thing the painkillers, after surgery, I wouldn't take anything but a Motrin. Yeah. And the surgeon said, you've got to keep this pain under control. And I said, I'm keeping it under control with Motrin. And they're like, you need to take this stuff. And they prescribed two narcotics to me. I didn't take the first one. Is that how some people become addicted? After surgery, they might take a narcotic? Yeah, I think, I think it's mm -hmm. the blend of, I think that if you've ever heard this, the opposite of addiction, is what do you know what it is? Rejection. No, you're no. close. What? Opposite of addiction is connection. Okay. So that that to me is like I don't believe that necessarily somebody just coming off of medic or coming off of surgery and then is on a medication that they'll necessarily become addicted mm -hmm. because those are the people that I would normally steal pills from. Your drugs from. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm you wouldn't believe what I flushed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people and and. and you know, it, it was marketable at big dollars, yeah. big dollars, because they insisted on filling these prescriptions. Well, I flushed that crap, which probably isn't good. You're supposed to take it and turn it yeah. in. I did turn in some bottles. But, but it just blew my mind because I thought, why would a doctor, when I'm telling him I'm dealing with the pain, I don't need that, why do they insist on prescribing that? Yeah, it's definitely changed as far as, like, more regulations in regards to you know, pain pills and everything. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, they were considered virtually non-addictive for a mm -hmm. while. Wow, and wow, that's wow. That's pretty far from the truth, right? That's pretty far. Now, Charlie, will you give your phone number of the facility where you of work? Of course. Please, can you yeah. do that? Of course. So the phone number is 678-454-6400. If you want help or you know, just need somebody to talk to, um, feel free to call 24 hours a day and we're always available and you know, willing to, to support you. Now, I have a surprise. We're about to go off the air, but we're gonna play one of my favorite songs and I'm gonna share. We're gonna be giving away some t-shirts because they came in and oh, do I love these. I might be responsible for getting this uh, design done by one of my favorite designers that I've used for 16 years, but this is the coolest thing ever. And today we're going off the air with a song that I think is very appropriate for today. It's called Long Black Limousine. I will tell you, addiction could lead you to being in the back of a long black limousine. So watch what you're doing. Ask for help, ask for God's guidance. And I was gonna read a page out of Mike Smith's book, but we didn't. Will you promise me you'll come back? Of course. Of course, okay, he's coming back. Now we're gonna go now to the most requested song by Mr. Ella J, Long Black Limousine. Here we go. I'll see you again tomorrow, only on ETC. Party.